According to bone experts, the bones of ancient man were up to twice as thick as modern man, and if the attachment points for muscles were any indication, then they were massively pumped up. Indeed, skeletal and genetic studies prove that ancient man would have been a formidable foe, spending their lives stabbing great beasts to death with wooden spears and carrying their carcasses back to his cave, where he cracked open the bones to consume the protein-rich marrow. Their brains were more primitive than ours, but they still attacked life with an animalistic ferocity. Indeed, new research on ancient man has revealed surprising insights into genetics that contradict popular beliefs about evolution. Far from stooped over primitive savages, stumbling around scavenging meat scraps, our forefathers and cousins were skilled hunters and dangerous warriors with muscular physiques, fast sprinters with strong throwing arms who could compete with the best athletes. Ancient man cannot be compared to modern hunter-gatherers who hunt deer with a bow and arrow, rather than using a confrontational hunting style. In fact, Homo erectus developed the ability to run and sprint on African plains before fleeing to Eurasia around two million years ago to escape a particularly harsh African drought. In East Asia, Java man grew into a massive specimen much larger than his African counterparts, but then, around 900,000 years ago, humanity experienced a bottleneck caused by a long and severe ice age that lasted more than 100,000 years. Only the strongest, fastest, most intelligent and adaptable humans survived this bottleneck and passed on their genes. One theory suggests that the descendants of Java Man repopulated Eurasia and Africa during a warm interglacial around 700,000 years ago. What's more, Evidence shows that Homo erectus used baseball-sized rocks to take down prey on the African savanna over two million years ago. A fastball to the head or legs would easily disable an animal such as a gazelle at distances up to 100 feet away, according to the study. These throwing skills were then transferred to throwing spears at least 500,000 years ago as early humans perfected the weight and aerodynamics needed to accurately throw. Other studies have shown that throwing sticks, also known as boomerangs, were used at least 400,000 years ago in Europe and could have been used to hunt birds and small fast prey such as rabbits. So early humans had an arsenal of throwing spears, thrusting spears, throwing sticks and rocks at their disposal for hunting long before modern humans invented the spear thrower and bow and arrow. What's more, the remains of a Russian Neanderthal with a super-strong arm suggest that Neanderthals were heavily pumped up on male hormones, possessing a hormonal status unlike anything seen in humans today, according to a recent paper. The study, published in the journal Archaeology, Ethnology and Anthropology of Eurasia, concluded that male Neanderthals most likely evolved their muscular physiques as a result of lifestyle, genes, climate and diet. Neanderthal females were no delicate creatures either, and would not have been beauties by modern standards. Neanderthal males hunted in the extreme, which helped to strengthen their arms. Neanderthal males would engage in face-to-face -face contact, jabbing long, thick spears directly into the animal's flesh instead of shooting prey, such as mammoths, from a distance. Compared to anatomically modern humans, both male and female Neanderthals had a larger muscle mass and experienced higher loading on the upper extremity than did Homo sapiens. Also, they differed from modern humans by a greater functional difference between the sexes in the use of the right arm. Nevertheless, Neanderthal males had huge right arms, while Neanderthal females had arms that were more evenly matched and not nearly as muscular. Surprisingly, only two decades ago, anthropologists believed that Neanderthals were poor runners and throwers, lacking the skeletal adaptations to run quickly or throw with force. These studies, which relied on very little fossil evidence, concluded that their feet were not designed for running and their shoulders and hands were not structurally adapted to precisely throw a spear. To investigate this further, researchers examined genetic variants previously associated with elite power or sprint athletes. The researchers discovered that the majority of these power-related genetic variants were much more common in Neanderthals than in humans today. In fact, researchers looked at 39 power-associated alleles and compared their frequencies in modern humans and Neanderthals. The study found 
that the majority of the power-associated alleles are more common among Neanderthals than among modern humans. This is consistent with power phenotypes being more common in Neanderthals than in modern humans. However, it is possible that Neanderthals possessed even more genes associated with power or endurance locomotion that are not found in modern human populations. Therefore, researchers hypothesized that the highly muscular Neanderthal body form reflects an adaptation to woodland hunting conditions rather than cold weather, and in a new paper, paleoecological evidence shows that they lived primarily in woodlands, and genetic analysis supports this new hypothesis. The glacial adaptation hypothesis is the most widely accepted explanation for Neanderthal body form. Nevertheless, paleoecological associations appear to point to a less cold woodland environment. Under such conditions, encounter and ambush hunting would have been preferred over pursuit hunting, resulting in greater muscular power and sprinting speed rather than endurance capacity. One reason researchers believe Neanderthals lived in a cold climate is that their remains were discovered alongside those of Ice Age mammals, such as mammoths, woolly rhinos, horses and reindeer. Some researchers argue that their physical characteristics, particularly short limbs, a large nasal cavity and a large torso, were evolutionary adaptations to living in cold climates. But hunting in the woods typically requires speed and acceleration. This is because encountering prey behind trees can be unexpected and require a quick response. In contrast, modern humans' endurance running is better suited for pursuit hunting in open grassland or tundra environments, according to the report. Based on this woodland theory, researchers hypothesized that Neanderthals were better suited to sprinting than distance running. The hypothesis that Neanderthals were built for speed provides us with a new perspective on their body form. Long-distance runners tend to be lean and have long limbs, whereas short-distance runners are much more muscular and may have shorter limbs in proportion to their overall body size. So it's now clear that the Neanderthal build resembles sprinters rather than long-distance runners, but there's more. Another new study found that modern humans inherited beneficial Neanderthal pigmentation genes, contrary to what we have been told in the past. Furthermore, the ancestral gene is linked to light pigmentation in approximately half of the predicted causal genes. The Neanderthal and Denisovan genome sequences, which diverged from modern human sequences 804,000 years ago, contain the ancestral gene. The most intriguing finding is that some ancestral light skin genes are shared by modern human populations and archaic hominins like Neanderthals and Denisovans. This suggests that this trait had a shared, common ancestor before the three hominin lineages diverged. These findings support the hypothesis that darker pigmentation is a derived trait that evolved in the genus Homo within the last two million years, after human ancestors lost most of their protective body hair, though these ancestral hominins may have been moderately, rather than darkly, pigmented. In fact, it appears that light and dark pigmentation have evolved throughout hominid history. The majority of the variants for both light and dark skin date back to antiquity. They most likely evolved in hominids such as Homo erectus, long before the emergence of our own species, and have coexisted for hundreds of thousands of years. Researchers agree that our early Australopithecine ancestors in Africa likely had light skin beneath hairy pelts. When you shave a chimp, the skin is light and muscular, similar to our ancient ancestors. If you have body hair, you do not require dark skin to protect yourself from ultraviolet UV radiation. Until recently, researchers assumed that after our human ancestors shed most of their body hair sometime before two million years ago, they quickly evolved dark skin to protect themselves from skin cancer and other UV radiation-related effects. When humans migrated out of Africa and into the far north, they evolved lighter skin as a response to limited sunlight. The most dramatic discovery involved a gene called MFSD12. Two mutations that reduced the expression of this gene were found in high frequency in people with the darkest skin. These variants appeared around a half million years ago, implying that human ancestors prior to that time may have had moderately dark skin, rather than the deep black hue produced by these mutations. 
In fact, skin tone has varied dramatically among humans for at least the last 900,000 years. So concludes a study of genetic variants linked to skin pigmentation in people from various African regions. According to the findings, some dark skin tones evolved relatively recently from paler genetic variants. In other words, darker skin is a more recent genetic trait, whereas lighter skin is more ancient. The combined data enabled the study to identify eight sites in the human genome that are strongly associated with skin pigmentation. For each of the eight sites of variation, there was a genetic variant associated with paler skin and one associated with darker skin. Seven of the paler skin variants evolved at least 270,000 years ago. Four of these appeared over 900,000 years ago, just after the aforementioned population bottleneck. According to current thinking, Homo sapiens first appeared in Africa around 300,000 years ago, but relatively pale skin tone variants existed before our species and have remained in some parts of Africa ever since. For example, the 300,000-year-old African cowboy skull implies an incredibly robust individual with the most pronounced brow ridges of any known hominid. Its massive and heavy face is even more simian in appearance than that of Neanderthal man, with huge inflated brow ridges that are notably conspicuous and extended, particularly at the lateral angles. Cabwe man would have had a very muscular build, with strong brow ridges and a broad face, and was a strong and adaptive hominid. He could be the next step up from Neanderthal in the escalating succession, and is sometimes referred to as the African Neanderthal. Neanderthals and modern humans diverged completely at least 500,000 years ago and possibly up to one million years ago, with Neanderthals concentrated in western Eurasia. Then, around 70,000 years ago, modern human groups that are ancestral to all non-Africans left the continent and spread across Eurasia, most likely encountering Neanderthals in what is now the Middle East. Couplings between the two groups of humans may date back 100,000 years or earlier, when some modern human pioneers made tentative journeys beyond Africa. Most people alive today have traces of genes inherited from Neanderthals, the enduring legacy of prehistoric interactions with our big-headed cousins. In fact, researchers have long debated when and where this mingling occurred, as well as whether these were one-time romps or regular trysts. According to an analysis of ancient and modern genomes, contemporary people's Neanderthal DNA originated from a single prolonged period of mixing around 47,000 years ago. However, not all of the inherited Neanderthal DNA from those early encounters survives in humans today. Much has been lost over time as a result of natural selection, chance or lineages dying out. Researchers use computer software to track the evolution of Neanderthal genes over time in various ancient and recent populations, estimating how many generations it would take for the genomes to subtly diverge the way they did. Because the study included ancient Homo sapiens genomes, their analysis achieved a level of precision that was simply not possible in previous studies based primarily on modern genomes. According to the report, Neanderthal genes began to flow into the ancestors of modern humans around 47,000 years ago. The researchers discovered that a scenario in which Neanderthals and modern humans exchanged genes over a period of 6,000 to 7,000 years best matched the genetic data. Homo sapiens who lived more than 40,000 years ago carried some Neanderthal DNA that is not found in modern populations. This suggests that their ancestors may have had other encounters with Neanderthals, but their lineage died out without leaving any known living descendants. Clearly, humans were encountering Neanderthals all over the place. Perhaps some of these early interactions took place in populations that did not leave descendants. According to the findings, approximately 5% of the interbreeding population's genes came from Neanderthals in the early days of gene flow, wherever it occurred. That means that 25 out of every 1,000 humans in this population, which eventually became ancestral to all people outside of Africa, was a Neanderthal. The implication is that those early dispersals became extinct, were effectively replaced, or were swamped by larger later waves. If that's the case, these ancient humans were in good company because most ancient humans did not leave any descendants. 
It's either an early event that happened in South, Southwest Asia, as modern humans first came out, they met some Neanderthals, might be 25 Neanderthals and a thousand modern humans, that would be enough. Mm. And then that DNA gets carried with those modern humans as they spread out from that area. Another